Hi everybody, welcome back. We're now moving into our genetics chapters, and these are usually fun. Um, don't get scared when you look at the genetics problems that you have assigned. Uh, they're actually kind of fun puzzles to, th to uh, do. So think about um, your genetics assignments as little puzzles that you get to work out. All right, so let's get through on our assignments. Um, in our lab manual, which I have posted on DropSend. I have a folder that has separate uh, scanned in images of every page for those of you who don't have a lab manual available to you. Um, I have assigned a number of the problems. So the first is reading through and solving a whodunit forensic DNA project. And this kind of tells you how forensic, exa forensic examiners would solve uh, a problem of DNA left at a crime scene. And so that's kind of fun to do. The other project from the lab manual that you have is there's karyotypes in there, karyotype A, B, or C. And uh, I show you an example of it here of how you do this project. You only have to do one. You can pick A, B, or C and turn in one of those. Okay, and so you need to basically patch all your uh, genes together and solve what the genetic issue is uh, from that karyotype. And then the part that seems to be the hardest for everybody is answering the questions that are at the end of the lab manual. And that's questions one through 12 and questions 19 through 23. I didn't make you do all of them. Um, they're kind of repetitive. So just making sure that you know how to do these so that when it comes test time, you're able to solve these problems. All right, so let's look at what, what it is you have to do. So the Strawberry Fields Forensic Project is this uh, problem in your book. And it's a couple of pages. I just uh, took a little snapshot of it. And you just need to tell me who killed Penny Lane based on the DNA evidence and the rest of the assignment leads you through it. For the karyotype problem here, I think I have a picture of karyotype A and you have pages in your book. This middle page here is where you can line up and uh, sort out your genes. And the picture on the right in yellow is a project that somebody turned in last year uh, that shows all the genes all lined up. And then they're able to tell me what the disorder is. Um, you have three possible disorders that are listed in your lab manual. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but you just cut out and you literally paste and line up all, all those genes together. And then the assignments for doing the questions comes here at the end of the lab manual, starting on page 116 and I think through uh, 119. And I put the first and the last just so you're clear about which questions it is that you need to do. And you will be making out Punnett squares, which hopefully you'll learn how to do in this um, video. Okay, so solving problems for genetics with Punnett squares. And this is a process-oriented thing where normally I work a bunch of problems out with a class and sometimes I meet with people who are having problems uh, figuring out how to do this a little bit after lab or during lab time. And sometimes uh, I actually last semester ran a tutorial, not just for my class, but for all the other classes um, that were having trouble learning how to do the Punnett square. But obviously we can't do that in person. So I looked for and found a couple of tutorials about how to do Punnett squares with somebody working them out on the blackboard. So they tell you the process of how to think through this. And so this organic chemistry tutor video is very good, as is the um, Khan Academy. The Khan Academy repeats some from the organic chemistry tutor video at the beginning, um, but then it goes through uh, some of the more difficult problems at the end. So you could probably even watch the first one and then zip through halfway through or just watch the Khan Academy video, whatever works for you. Um, clearly, I don't have a blackboard or a whiteboard at home and I would need to be working out the problems and having somebody else photograph me uh, 
Um, so you can see where I have a problem trying to show you how to do these. But I've, I've tried to work it out a little bit on these slides. So you have a significant number of assigned problems to turn in for this. Um, so I really, really hope that you will spend some time going through those Punnett Square videos. All right, and your textbook now starts out with discussing uh, cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis, it's a hereditary disease that affects both the lungs and the digestive system. And the body ends up producing a very thick and sticky mucus that can clog the lungs. And it will also obstruct uh, the ducts and the pancreas that are releasing all these uh, important enzymes for digesting your food. Cystic fibrosis can be life-threatening, and people with this condition tend to have a shorter than normal lifespan. I actually had a really uh, good friend in medical school who had cystic fibrosis, and he had had a lung transplant. And he interviewed with me for his position in med school on the same day, so I knew him right from the very beginning. And unfortunately, he died in the middle of medical school. He got a uh, overwhelming infection that tends to affect people with uh, cystic fibrosis who've had lung transplants and are on immunosuppressants. And of course, it uh, made the whole class very sad. I still get really sad when I think about him. So 60 years ago, many children with cystic fibrosis died before they reached elementary school age. But with all the advances in treatment, um, we get many of them to live at least into their, I'd say about 30, some beyond. Depends how, um, on the specific uh, problems that these people have. Um, there's no cure for it. It affects about 30,000 people in the United States every year. About 1,000 new cases are diagnosed each year. Um, of the new diagnoses, about 75% are made in children that are under the age of 2 years old. And a lot of times the mothers will uh, start to say that when they, they kiss the babies, um, the babies taste salty. And this is because the CFTR gene encodes the CFTR protein, as you see here. And this is a transport protein that moves chloride ions out of epithelial cells. And therefore, sodium chloride is salt and you end up with a salty taste for these uh, on the skin surface of these babies. The ultimate deletion ends up being a deletion of three base pairs. It's called the Delta F508 because it encodes a CFTR protein that's missing the phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is represented by uh, F. And this is normally at the 508th amino acid position. A CFTR protein that's missing this amino acid misfolds in this small area. And this small defect ends up interfering with cellular processes that would otherwise finish the protein and install it into the plasma membrane. So normally a newly translated CFTR polypeptide is modified by the endoplasmic reticulum exported to a Golgi body, and here a carbohydrate is attached to it. The finished protein is then packaged into vesicles and sent out to the plasma membrane. CFTR polypeptides that have the missing amino acid are produced properly but aren't folded right, and the cellular um, control mechanism recognizes this misfolded uh, region and destroys most of these before they leave the endoplasmic reticulum. A few of the misfolded proteins will reach the plasma membrane and then they're often taken back into the cell by endocytosis and destroyed. So epithelial cell membranes that lack the CFTR protein can't transport chloride ions. As well, not enough water is leaving them either so the surface of the epithelial cell sheets become too dry. And the mucus then gets dry, thick, and clogging, and it accumulates in passageways, and it makes breathing difficult. The mucus also obstructs the um, digestive uh, passageways in the gut, 
Males become infertile because the flow of sperm is hampered through the tubes of the reproductive system. And uh, in addition to the role in transporting the chloride ion, this uh, CFTR protein also helps alert the immune system to bacteria in the lungs. The CFTR protein functions as a receptor binding directly to bacteria and causing them to be taken into the cell by endocytosis. In epithelial cells that line the respiratory tract, endocytosis of bacteria will cause an immune system response. Without the CFTR protein, um, this uh, immune response and trapping of this bacteria will fail. So people with cystic fibrosis get chronic bacterial infections of the lungs. And as with my friend, this is how people tend to die from cystic fibrosis is by these overwhelming respiratory infections. Now, despite many of the men being rendered infertile uh, with this disease because the sperm can't travel through the spermatic ducts, um, CF still is a relatively common disease. It's a gene that persists in the population and it persists through the carrier status. Um, it, as I said, affects about 30,000 people in the United States, but it's estimated that about 10 million people are carriers of the cystic fibrosis gene. And you'll find, uh, as with most diseases, the likelihood of carrying the CF gene will vary by ethnicity, with it being more common in white Europeans and Ashkenazic Jews. It's about 1 in 29 in the, those populations. Hispanics, um, the chance of having being a CF carrier is about 1 in 46. And for African Americans, it's about 1 in 61 whereas in Asian Americans, it's about 1 in 90. And hopefully, you'll understand the carrier status a little bit more as we go through um, some of the disorders and understanding genetics a little better after we get through the next two chapters. Hopefully, you'll come to understand that if both parents who don't have the disease, but if both are carriers, their children will have a 25% chance of having cystic fibrosis. They'll have a 50% chance of being a carrier and a 25% chance of not having cystic fibrosis and not being a carrier. So first, we're going to study some genes. Uh, we're going to go back into the 19th century and look at the studies of a 19th century monk, Gregor Mendel. Mendel is considered the father of genetics, and through his work on pea plants, he discovered the fundamental laws of inheritance. He deduced that genes come in pairs and are inherited as distinct units, one from each parent. Mendel tracked the segregation of parental genes and their appearance in the offspring as either dominant or recessive traits, and he recognized the mathematical patterns of inheritance from one generation to the next. So in the 19th century, people thought that the hereditary material must be some type of fluid, with fluids from both parents blending and mixing at fertilization like milk in a coffee cup. However, the idea of blending inheritance failed to explain what people could see with their own eyes, that children sometimes have traits such as freckles that do not appear in either parent, or a cross between a black horse and a white horse doesn't produce some sort of blended horse that appears to be gray. So over the years, Mendel had been collecting evidence of how inheritance works um, by cultivating garden pea plants. And it turns out to be very uh, serendipitous that he used these because the species is a naturally self-fertilizing uh, plant, which means each plant's flowers produce both male and female gametes. And these will form viable embryos when the two meet up 
and in order to study inheritance, Mendel had to carry out controlled matings between the individuals with specific traits. So first, he prevented the pea plants from self-fertilizing. He had to remove the pollen-bearing parts, the anthers, from their flowers. And then he cross-fertilized the plants by brushing the egg-bearing plants, the carpels of their flowers, with pollen from other plants. He then collected the seeds that were produced from the cross-fertilized individuals and recorded the traits of the offspring that grew up from these seeds. And all these uh, experiments took him about eight years from 1856 to 1863, and he then published his results in 1865. During this time, he grew over about 10,000 pea plants, and he kept track of the progeny, which is the next generation, the children, um, the seedlings, and the, their type. And his work and his laws of inheritance weren't quite appreciated in his time, but over time, um, it was about 1900 or so when they rediscovered his work that his experimental results were fully under, beginning to be fully understood. So let's start taking a look at that. Certainly, if they can understand this in 1900, you should be able to understand it today. So his experiments are called crosses, and they start with plants that uh, are called what breeds true um, for particular traits, such as white flowers versus purple flowers. Breeding true for a trait means that um, all the offspring will have the same form of the trait as the parent. Remember, these were self-fertilizing flowers. So the white flowers produce white flowers, produce more white flowers, always produce white flowers. The purple flowers did the same. So what Mendel would do is he would cross-fertilize the pea plants that bred true for one trait, such as white flowers, with ones that bred true for the other uh, trait, the purple flower. Um, basically, it's the same trait, the color of flower, but one bred true always as being white, one bred true always as being purple. And he would cross-pollinate them. And he found uh, that the traits of the offspring appeared in predictable patterns. And his meticulous work in tracking these traits led him to conclude uh, that hereditary information passed from one generation to the next in discrete units that were called genes. So Mendel went off to the University at Vienna and he studied math and physics under uh, Christian Doppler, for whom the Doppler waves uh, are named. So he had a good mathematical foundation. And in 1853, after completing his studies at the University of Vienna, he returned to the monastery and was given a teaching position at a secondary school. And this is where he would stay for more than a decade. And it was during this time that he began the experiments for which he is well known. As I said, he discovered that um, traits were inherited in discrete units that we now call genes. Um, and he discovered this almost a century before the discovery of DNA. Of course, we now know that uh, genes are located on chromosomes, and specifically, the location of a gene on a chromosome is what we call its locus, or we use the word loci, uh, plural, when referring to multiple locations. We now know that diploid cells have pairs of homologous chromosomes, um, so they have two copies of each gene. In most cases, both copies are expressed at the same level. The two copies of any gene may be identical or they may vary as alleles. And alleles are the alternate forms of genes that arise by mutation and are found at the same locus or location on a chromosome. And we went over this in our uh, chapter 12 uh, and described the locus in the different alleles or alternate forms of um, of a gene. So an individual uh, with the same allele on both homologous chromosomes is described as being 
homozygous for the allele, homo meaning the same. Organisms breed true for a trait because they're homozygous for alleles governing that trait. By contrast, an individual with different alleles at a gene locus is described as being heterozygous, hetero meaning mixed. A hybrid is a heterozygous individual produced by a cross or mating between parents that be breed true for the different forms of the trait. Okay, here is a nice picture of the location of a few genes on a few different uh, human chromosomes. You know, genetic disor disorders that result from mutations in genes are indicated in red on these chromosomes. The number or letter below a chromosome is its name. Characteristic banding patterns appear after staining. A similar map of all 23 chromosomes is in Appendix 4 of your textbook if you wanted to look at that. So a hybrid is a heterozygous individual produced by a cross or mating between parents that breed true for different forms of the trait. So a breeding true white plant mated with a breeding true purple plant will produce also a purple plant, and we'll learn about dominance and recessive in a little bit, um, that is a hybrid of those two breeding true white and purple parental plants. The genotype, which is the particular set of alleles that an individual carries, will determine the phenotype, which is the observable trait in an individual. The phenotype is going to be whether the plant has white flowers or purple flowers, or whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes, and that is determined by what set of underlying genes that the individual organism has inherited. And as we stated, an individual with the same allele on both homologous chromosomes is homozygous, whereas an individual with different or alternate forms of an allele at a gene locus is heterozygous. A hybrid is a heterozygous individual produced by the cross or mating between parents that breed true for a specific trait or breed true for a specific phenotype. Now the phenotype of this hybrid or heterozygous organism depends on how the products of its two different alleles will interact. In many cases, the effect of one allele will influence the effect of another. And the outcome of this interaction is reflected in the individual's phenotype. So an allele is dominant when its effect is the effect that prevails over the recessive allele. A dominant allele is usually represented um, by an uppercase italicized letter when we're doing genetics problems, whereas recessive traits are represented by lowercase italicized letters. So here I'm showing you capital letters such as the capital letter P will signify a dominant allele. In this case, we're talking about the plant flower color. So purple is dominant over the white flowers, the little p. So our breeding true white plant has two alleles that will be represented by little lowercase p and p. Okay, so they're a homozygous breeding true recessive for the white color. Whereas when they're mated with the breeding true plant that is homozygous for that dominant purple color, that parental plant that breeds true for purple will have two uppercase P alleles being represented. And you mate them and they inherit the progeny, the children, the next generation, will inherit one allele from each parent. And so they are heterozygous or the hybrid. And so they become uppercase P and lowercase P, okay? And they will be purple because purple is dominant. So the uh, parent with the homozygous uppercase PP and the child that's uppercase P and lowercase P have the same phenotype, 
but you can see their genotype is different. Okay, and so we see this on this next slide where you see the parental plant that's purple, uppercase PP, has purple flowers. And the other parental plant that's lowercase PP, homozygous for the recessive allele, P, lowercase p, which represents white flowers. And then we have the progeny, the hybrid from the cross of these two plants, that inherits one uppercase gene, one lowercase allele, right, represented. Uh, and so this uh, plant is uppercase P and lowercase P, and it is um, a purple plant. It just has a different genotype. And the dominant trait, the purple flower, is what prevails. And students always wonder, why can't I use W for the white color? Um, and the reason is, is we're trying to keep track of understanding that this is one gene. And so we want to represent the alternate forms of the gene. So in this case, we have a binary world, purple versus white, big P versus small P. And you're trying to keep track of which allele dom is dominant over the other allele. So stick to using one letter that represents the two alternate forms. It gets more complicated when you start looking at things like flower color and you have multiple uh, forms. And we'll see how we do that when we get to blood type with humans and how to keep that straight. Okay, so homologous chromosomes and all the alleles they carry will segregate into separate gametes during meiosis. Hopefully after going through chapter 12, you understand that from meiosis. When the homologous chromosomes separate during meiosis, the gene pairs on those chromosomes separate too. Remember all the alternate forms of the alleles on those genes. So we'll use our pea plant alleles for purple and white flowers as an example, and we'll look at that in the next slide. And here we see represented in blue, a plant that's homozygous for the dominant allele, large P, large P, uppercase P's, can only make gametes that carry the dominant allele, uppercase P, that represents our purple flowered plant. A plant that's homozygous for the uh, recessive allele, lowercase P, lowercase P, that you see on the right, represented also by the pink chromosomes, can only make gametes that carry the recessive allele uh, represented by the lowercase p. If the two plants are crossed, large p, large p, by little p, little p, only one outcome is possible. A gamete carrying allele uppercase p meets up with a gamete that's carrying lowercase p. Because you see from the meiotic divisions uh, that the pink plant with the lowercase can only produce lowercase pink alleles, right? And the plant that has uppercase P, the blue genes there, can only produce uppercase genes. So when the gametes from those two unite to form a zygote, that zygote is going to have one gene from one parent carrying the uppercase P and another gene or chromosome that carries the gene uh, with the lowercase p from the other parent. I hope you understand that. So one of the great values in, in studying genetics is in understanding how we can predict the likelihood of inheriting particular traits. This can help plant and animal breeders in developing varieties that have more desirable qualities. It can also help human beings explain and predict patterns of inheritance in family lines. And one of the easiest ways to calculate the mathematical probability of inheriting specific traits was invented by a 20th century English geneticist named Reginald Punnett. And so we call it the Punnett Square. And this is a simple graphical way of discovering all the potential combinations of genotypes that can occur in the progeny or the children, given the genotypes of their parents. It also shows us the odds of each of the offspring genotypes occurring. So 
We're going to set up a Punnett square and you'll see the grid by drawing just a, a, a grid of perpendicular lines. And then you put the genotype of one parent across the top and the other of the parent down the left-hand side. We're going to use alleles for a pretend dominant and recessive trait where capital A will be the dominant trait and A is the recessive trait. Okay, so you see here I've uh, set it up for a male and a female. I had the male have the, domin uh, have the recessive trait, little a, little a, and the female is going to have uh, breed true for the dominant trait, uppercase a, uppercase a, big A, big A, right? All right, so we set up our grid of boxes, um, and usually you draw in the per perpendicular lines here. I have it as boxes, okay? And you put the genotype of one parent across the top. Here, I put the female, big A, big A, across the top, and I drew in an arrow showing you where I put those uh, separated out each allele, okay? And then I put in uh, the genotype for the male, and that um, genotype will go down the grid on the left-hand side. And he's represented here, uh, his gametes, as little a, little a. Now, just for the ease of us keeping track, I put the females all in blue colors and the males all in variations of red. And so you can keep track of each specific allele. Um, I put them in different shades of red and blue. So you can see what we're doing here. All right. Now we're going to move into predicting the kinds of offspring that a mating of a male with the breeding true homozygous for the recessive trait uh, when he breeds with a female who is homozygous breeding true for the dominant trait. Okay, so we see here in the first row of creating a new zygote or a new progeny generation, we have uh, in box one, we have a zygote inheriting the big A above it from the mother, okay, in the dark blue. And then we have in that first box uh, inheriting a little a from the father in red, okay, the dark red. So you, can you see that there? Then in the second box across the row, they inherited the other allele from their mom. This is another, another offspring, another individual, okay? And they inherited the lighter blue or the brighter blue, uh, big A from mom, and they inherited still that same uh, little a from dad. Now we move into the next slide. And then we see in the third box at the bottom row, they inherited, that individual inherited the big A uh, allele from mom, and it's the dark big A. And then they inherited the bright uh, colored red little a from dad. And then in the last box, you see the individual inherited the bright colored uh, large a from mom and the bright colored little a from dad. All of the individuals have the same genotype uh, from this mating pattern because they can only inherit it a big A from mom, and they could only inherit a little a from dad. And the different colors just show you the separation or the segregation of the genes of the homologous chromosomes from each other that occurred in meiosis. On this next slide, I have it uh, with uh, the P genes, and this is from your textbook, I believe. This is the Punnett square, and it shows you how to fill it in, only they filled it in backwards from the fourth box going up to the top box, and you can work it either way you want. 
Here, in this case, you had the male gametes having the dominant uppercase Ps and the female gametes having the lowercase Ps. And it shows you how you fill in each box. And you see in the progeny generation, the mating of a male with the dominant gene, big P, big P, and a female breeding true or homozygous for the recessive trait, little p, little p, all of the individuals in the progeny generation, the children generation, will have a genotype that's big P, little p. If this were the example of our purple and white flowers, you would see that the, the children were all purple. But unlike the dad that was purple and had the genotype big P, big P, all the individuals in this generation are heterozygous. They carry one of the recessive genes. Their big P, little p is their genotype. So you can see how you have two different genotypes, but you have the same phenotype. Okay, phenotype is what you look like. All purple flowers. And if you aren't clear yet on how to make a Punnett square and interpret its result, uh, take some time to try to figure it out before you go on because that's what we're going to be doing a lot of for the rest of this lecture. Okay, so just to review, an offspring's genotype is the result of the combination of genes in the sex cells or the gametes, the sperm and the ova, that came together at its conception. One sex cell came from each parent. Each sex cell or gamete, the sperm and the ova, normally only have one copy of each gene for each trait. And that's how, why we separated out the two homologous chromosomes or the two parental genes for each trait because we're forming the gametes, right? Each of the two Punnett square boxes in which the parent genes for a trait are placed across the top for the mom there or down the left-hand side for the dad represents one of the two possible genotypes for the parent sex cell or parental gamete, the sperm or the egg. Which of the two parental copies of a gene is inherited depends on which uh, gamete is inherited. And that's a matter of, a ch of chance. By placing each of the two copies in its own box, it has the effect of giving it a 50% chance of being inherited. Okay, I hope you can see that. All right, now we're going to go on. In a test cross, an individual that has a dominant trait, but an unknown genotype, so it could be, as in the previous case, purple, but we don't know if it's big P, big P, or big P, little p, okay, is crossed with an individual that is known to be homozygous for the recessive allele. And we're gonna do this cross to try to bring out where the dominant alleles are. The pattern of traits among the offspring of the cross can reveal whether the tested individual is heterozygous or homozygous for the dominant trait. If all of the offspring of the test cross have the dominant trait, as occurred in our previous example, then the parent with the unknown genotype is going to be homozygous for the dominant allele. Now, if some of the offspring have the recessive trait, then they had to inherit two recessive genes, one from each parent. So then the test cross reveals that the one parent with the purple flowers would have to have been heterozygous or big P, little p. Okay, so the monohybrid cross is a test cross that checks for the dominance relationship between just two alleles, two alternate forms, like our big P versus little p of our purple flowers. It can be a cross between either a true breeding homozygous individual, as I said, big P, big P, crossed with a white flowered or little p, little p, p plant, or between two identical heterozygotes. Mendel investigated dominant and recessive alleles for seven different genes, including stem length, seed color, and pod texture. And here we see the results 
of Mendel's experiments. You see in the leftmost column the specific trait or phenotype. In the middle column you see which one Mendel discovered was the dominant form of the trait. And in the right hand column you see which one he discovered was the recessive form. Now let's discuss a little bit about some of the uh, symbolism that we use. We've already discussed how we use the uppercase letter for being the dominant allele. And we use the lowercase levels for being the recessive allele. And these are alternate alleles for the same gene. So we use the same letter. Big P for purple, the dominant color, and little p for white, the recessive color. As we keep track of the generations in a cross, we use um, a large P to stand for the parental generation. And there will only be one P, so you know that it, we're talking about the generations. And F for filial, or the offspring, the progeny, the children. F1 describes the first generation offspring, which would be the kids, the children. F2 describes the second filial generation, um, which would be the offspring from the F1, or the grandkids, okay? So in a monohybrid test cross, true breeding parents of each phenotype will be crossed to yield the F1 generation, their children, their filial generation or offspring. A cross of the F1 hybrids is the actual test cross generation that we use. So the F2 generation will offer information about the dominance between the alleles. In a monohybrid test cross between two plants that are uh, hybrids or heterozygous, big P, little p plants, two types of gametes can meet up in four possible ways at fertilization. Okay, so you can see if you have one plant that's big P, little p, it will form some gametes that are big P. It will also form other gametes that are little p. Same thing for the other plant, the female plant. So we would have a sperm, this big P has the potential of meeting up with an egg that's big P. And they will form a zygote that is genotype big P, big P. And that would produce purple flowers. If we have a sperm that has the big P allele form of the gene and it meets an egg with a little p, the zygote that is formed will be the heterozygote, the big P and the little p. And because we've learned that the big P is dominant, it will have the phenotype of purple flowers. We can also have a sperm that's little p that meets up with an egg that is big P. And our zygote is then going to be the same uh, as the last genotype we just did, big P, little p. Or we could have written it as little p, big p, just to keep track of uh, whether it came from mom or dad. And that would be purple flowers. And we could also have inherited a little p in the gamete or the sperm from dad and a little p in the egg from the mom. And then we would have a genotype that is both lowercase p from both alleles, and that would produce white flowers. So you see three quarters of the possibility will produce purple flowered plants, and only one quarter of the gametes uh, has a chance of combining and forming white flowers. Okay, so we're going to set up a monohybrid cross between a big P little p and a big p little p. We're going to form a Punnett square and we're going to see if you can figure out how to do this and form the test cross. So I recommend pausing the video and see if you can draw this out on a sheet of paper and then start up the video uh, and we'll see if you were correct. And here is how you set up that test cross. We have a heterozygous purple plant, number one, or the male plant, if you want to call it that. And we have another heterozygous 
purple plant number two, okay? And we're going to cross them. And we write one of the plants across the top, big P and little p. And you see them in their separate boxes right there. And then for the other one, we're going to put it down the boxes in the left-hand side of the two gametes. And it will produce one that's a big P that we wrote in darker red and a little P that we put in more of an orangey color. And then we fill in the combinations of the two gametes meeting up. So from our top first box and our left-hand column first box, we can have the two gametes unite and they form a zygote that is big P, big P, the dark blue and the dark red. Then in this second box, we're going to have the big P dark red gamete from the first purple plant or the male in this case, if we want to call it that, meet up with the little P or the brighter blue small P from purple plant number two. And we have the genotype that is a little P, big P. Okay, so that will also be a purple plant, but it is heterozygous. It has one big P gene and one little P gene. Okay, then we go down and fill in the bottom box boxes. And you see we've inherited one little P gene from purple plant number one, that sort of orangey small lowercase p. But it's inherited the big P dark blue gene from purple plant number two. So it is big P little p that will be a purple plant. And it is heterozygous, one big P and one little p. And then we can fill in the last or the fourth remaining box. And that will inherit that little p from purple plant number one and also a little p from purple plant number two. Okay, so in that last box, you have little p, little p. And so that's inherited two recessive genes. And so that is a white flowering plant. And these are the only possible gametes that could form from these two different parental plants. Our parental plants or the parental generation, the P generation, would be the cross that we see at the top, right? And our progeny is what we filled in in all these boxes. And we see the genotypes become one-fourth big P, big P, homozygous dominant purple genotype. One half, we have two boxes, two of the four boxes, that are big P and little p. And these would be purple plants that are heterozygous. And then in our last remaining box, we have one fourth of our plants that are little p, little p. And these will be white, and they're homozygous recessive for the white flower. So our genotypes are one fourth big P, big P, one half, are big P and little p, and one-fourth is little p and little p. But our phenotypes, the color that we observe, is that three-quarters of our plants will be purple and one-quarter will be white. And here you see the same thing outlined, uh, kind of smaller, and that's why I did it separately, uh, from your textbook. Okay, so you see the purple plants and the possible genotypes. You see the um, parental uh, plants at the top. And in this case, you had a parent plant that was cross homozygous for white, so it was little p, little p. And it produced only the gametes that were little p and little p at the top. And you see the parent plant that was purple and true breeding uh, dominant for the purple plant, big P, big P. And so you see how it um, produced the same uh, results of three quarters purple and one quarter white when you um, breed two true breeding plants as opposed to two heterozygous plants. And so we found that Mendel observed there was a phenotype ratio of three to one, three boxes of one type purple to one type of white, one box 
in the F2 offspring of his monohybrid cross. So this matches the probability that the recessive genotype, the little p, little p in the offspring of a heterozygous cross. It also matched the probability of the genotype of two true breeding plants, right? Of crossing a big P, big P cross with a little p, little p. So these are the two ways that you can do um, monohybrid crosses. And this reveals Mendel's law of segregation. The patterns of the phenotypes revealed the underlying genotypes. And in modern terms, we would state this as a diploid cell has two copies of every gene that occurs on its homologous chromosomes. And the two copies might vary as alternate forms of the genes or alleles, two different alleles. The two alleles at any locus are distributed into separate gametes during meiosis. So the law of segregation is that a diploid cell has two copies of every gene that occurs on its homologous chromosomes. And the two alleles at any locus are distributed into separate gametes during meiosis because the two chromosomes divide from each other or separate during meiosis. So let's now relate what we've learned from our crosses to what we've learned from meiosis. Okay, as we discuss, Mendel's law of segregation, which is his first law, is that two members of a gene pair, the alleles, will segregate or separate from each other during the formation of the gametes. Half of the gametes will carry one allele and the other half carry the other allele. There's also the principle of independent assortment, which means that the genes for different traits will assort or uh, go into different gametes independently of one another during the formation of gametes. Now, this is a little bit harder to understand at this point because we, we've only been dealing with one trait. What this means with the law of independent assortment is that the two traits in a plant, and let's explain this by taking an example. Let's say the plant, we're talking about the height and the flower color. They're going to sort out separate from each other because the gene for height might be on say chromosome number one, whereas the gene for flower color might be on chromosome two. And which chromosome one, whether you inherited chromosome one from dad or mom, is going to be independent as to whether in your gamete you've gotten chromosome two being from either mom or dad. You can have chromosome one and two both being inherited from mom. You can have chromosome one from dad and chromosome two from mom. You know, you, you, you know the combinations or you should know after studying meiosis uh, last chapter. Okay, so to reveal the law of independent assortment, we have to look at dihybrid crosses. Crosses for two different traits. The monohybrid cross allowed us to study dominance relationship between the alleles of one gene and we were looking at flower color. But what about the alleles of two different genes? Let's say we have an individual who is heterozygous for two alleles at two different loci. So we can say gene A and gene B, okay? And do a cross between two individuals that would be big A, little a, and big B, little b. As with a monohybrid cross, the frequency of the traits appearing amongst the offspring of a dihybrid cross depends on the dominance relationships between the alleles. So we'll look how Mendel did a dihybrid cross. Let's say we start out with an individual that breathes true for two different traits. We'll use our previous example of flower color, big P for purple and little p for the recessive trait of white. And then we'll look at another uh, trait, say big T for tall and little T for short. 
So we're going to look at two different traits and see how all this parses out. The hybrid cross is going to begin with one parent that breeds true for both dominant traits, purple flowers and tall stems, and one that breeds true for the recessive traits, white flowers and short stems. So that will be a little p, little p, little t, little t plant. The big p, big p, big t, big t plant only makes gametes with the dominant alleles, big p and big t. And the completely recessive plant, the white flowered short plant, only makes gametes with recessive alleles, little p and little t. And remember, during meiosis, the members of a pair of genes on homologous chromosomes get distributed into gametes independently of the other gene pairs. Okay, so the best way to look at this example is by a picture. And here is the picture of the test cross in your textbook, okay? In the picture at the top of the page, we're starting out with a completely breeding true dominant plant, purple flowered and tall stems, big P, big P, big T, big T. And it's going to be bred with a completely recessive parental generation plant that breeds true for the recessive traits of white flowers and short stems. Little p, little p, little t, little t. Okay? These will only make gametes with the dominant alleles for the first plant and only make gametes with recessive alleles for the other plant. Therefore, our first filial generation or the progeny are all dihybrids or big P, little p, big T, little t from the combination of the big P, big T gamete with the little p, little t gamete. I hope that you understand that. Now where you get to number three, we're going to do our crossing of two dihybrid individuals or plants that we made in our first filial generation. So we're going to cross a big P, little p, big T, little t plant with another big P, little p, big T, little t plant. And this is where all the confusion comes in for you. So you have to try and figure out that you can do this. And think of it as kind of a fun puzzle for you to figure out. And it will make it a lot more pleasant. Four combinations of alleles are possible in the gametes made by big P, little p, and big T, little t, crossed with another big P, little p, big T, little t. If two of the plants are crossed, these four uh, gametes that are formed can combine in 16 possible ways. But let's break this down, okay? So one big P, little p, big T, little t plant can form four different types of gametes. It can form a, and let's go across the top where you see the circles. And you can see one gamete, possible gamete that it forms is a big T, big P, big T gamete. It can also have a big P with a little t. That's what you see in the second column there. Then it can also form a little p with a big T gamete. And that's the third column that you see. As well, the gamete that it can form could be recessive completely, little p and little t. Since it's mating with a similar type of plant down the uh, left-hand column for the other gametes are exactly the same. And then we figure out how they can combine. So you see in the first box for the formation of the second filial generation, the F2, you can see we've combined a big P, big T from one plant with a big P, big T gamete from another plant. And so it is completely homozygous dominant for both traits. It is big P, big P, Big T, big T 
purple flowered and tall stemmed. You can see in the second box, we've combined the big P and little t uh, gamete from one plant with that same big P and big T gamete from the uh, other plant. And that forms a big P, big P, big T, little t zygote. <clears throat> so it is purple and tall stemmed, and it is homozygous dominant for the purple flower trait, but it is heterozygous for the height trait. Then in the third box, you see that we have the gamete that is little p, big T, combines with a big, the same big P, big T gamete, okay? And that will form a big P, little P, big T, big T plant. So again, it is purple flowered and tall, but it is heterozygous for the purple flowering trait and homozygous for the tall trait. And you can go on so forth, filling in all these boxes until you get down to the very final box. And there you see, we have united the little p, little t gamete from the uh, plant one with the little p, little t from plant two, and you get the completely homozygous recessive plant that is both white flowering and short. Okay, here we see just the dihybrid cross spelled out, okay? And this is for other traits, okay? So we're looking at seed color here. And you have either your yellow seed, okay, that you see at the top that starts out with the uh, completely uh, dominant traits of being round and being yellow, okay, in the parental generation, crossed with the completely recessive, right? Uh, green and wrinkled and it forms gametes that will uh, be produced of just big Y and big R from the yellow and rounded seed and that will be crossed with gametes that are formed from the green and wrinkled seed and it will produce a heterozygous or F1 seed that is yellow and round but it is a big Y, little Y, big R, little R seed. And we see the same thing with the seeds for forming the dihybrid cross between a big Y, little Y, big R, little R seed with another one just like it for the F2 generation. And you see the same thing happens in the boxes. And what we found out is the same thing when you do your Punnett square is what Mendel finds out is that the dominant trait will prevail in 9 sixteenths of the plants, okay? That they will inherit both dominant phenotypes and be yellow and round. Whereas in 3 sixteenths of the phenotypes, they will inherit one dominant trait and one recessive trait. So here we see green and round. We also get three sixteenths that will inherit one dominant and one recessive trait. And so you will see the other uh, dominant recessive combination of yellow and wrinkled. And only one sixteenth of all the progeny will turn out to get both recessive traits, green and wrinkled. So you see how rare it is to get all the recessive traits. Now remember, when we did just one trait, three-fourths of the time, you ended up with the dominant trait and one-fourth the recessive trait. And you can see now we're doing this for two traits. That it's really, that's the same thing that's happening just separately, okay? And so now we have this new separated hybrid in the middle in which three sixteenths are going to be dominant plus recessive and another three sixteenths are going to be the opposite dominant and recessive combination.
So now that we've looked at um, different traits, the one that I showed you from the book and, and now this one for the seed color, um, it holds true. Um, Mendel discovered this 9331 ratio, but he, at first he didn't have any idea what it meant. He could only say that units specifying one trait, such as flower color, are inherited independently of units specifying other traits, such as plant heights. So in time, his hypothesis became known as the law of independent assortment. And of course, now we can apply it to our genes, that we have different traits on different genes that will sort out independently of each other in the formation of the gametes. During meiosis, the two alleles at one locus will be assorted into gametes independently of the alleles they're at that are at another locus. The principle of independent assortment describes how different genes independently separate from one another when reproductive cells develop. Mendel discovered this when he was performing dihybrid crosses, which are crosses between organisms that differ with regard to two traits. He discovered that the combination of traits in the offspring of his crosses did not always match the combination of traits in the parental organisms. And from his data, he formulated the principle of independent. We now know that this independent assortment of genes occurs during meiosis in eukaryotes. Meiosis, the type of cell division that reduces the number of chromosomes in a parent cell by half to produce four reproductive cells called gametes. In humans, our diploid cells contain 46 chromosomes with 23 chromosomes inherited from the mother and a second similar set of 23 chromosomes inherited from the father. The pairs of similar chromosomes are called the homologous chromosomes. And during meiosis, the pairs of homologous chromosomes are divided in half to form our haploid gametes. This separation or assortment of homologous chromosomes is random. And that means that all the maternal chromosomes will not be separated into one cell and all the paternal chromosomes will not be separated into another. Instead, after meiosis occurs, each haploid cell contains a mixture of the genes that the individual inherited from the mother and the father. The 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio is the classic Mendelian ratio for a dihybrid cross in which the alleles of two different genes assort independently into gametes. Nine individuals will display both dominant traits. Three individuals will display the first dominant trait and the second recessive trait. Three individuals will display the first recessive trait and the second dominant trait. And one individual will display both recessive traits. The second filial generation phenotype ratio is nine to three to three to one of those four possible phenotypes. Remember, this is starting out from the parental cross of one that's completely homozygous breeding true, dominant for one trait, and the other breeding homozygous breeding true, completely recessive for the other two traits. The first filial generation, the F1, will be dihybrid or heterozygous for both uh, traits. And then we breed those two doubly heterozygous organisms to create the F2 generation in which all these different phenotypes are revealed in the ratio 9 completely dominant to 3, one dominant and one recessive, to 3, the other dominant and other recessive, to 1, both recessive traits showing four possible phenotypes. And according to the law of independent assortment, genes for different traits will assort independently of one another in the formation of gametes. And the inheritance of one trait does not affect the inheritance of another trait.
And here we see this in the formation of the gametes. At A, this example shows just two pairs of homologous chromosomes in the nucleus of a diploid germ cell. Here we have the maternal and paternal chromosomes shown in pink and blue, and they've already been duplicated. At B, we see that either chromosome of a pair may get attached to either spindle pole during meiosis. This is during meiosis one, okay? With the two pairs of homologous chromosomes, there are two ways in which the maternal and paternal chromosomes can become attached to the two different spindle poles. In this example, they're tracking the alleles of genes on different chromosomes, okay? And you see them at, marked as little p, little p on the pink maternally uh, derived chromosome and little t, little t. And then on the paternally derived chromosomes that are in blue, you see big P, big P, and big T, and big T. Okay, so then when we get to C, we'll see that two nuclei form with each scenario. So there's a total of four possible combinations of alleles that can occur after meiosis one. So we see that first example in which you have the chromosomes separated as little p, little p, and little t, little t into one cell, and big p, big p, and big t, big t in the other cell. Similarly, you see a different segregation pattern where in the third cell, you see one cell that's little p, little p, and big t, big t, and another that's big p, big p, and little t, little t. And then in D, where we see our sister chromatids separating during meiosis II, the gametes that result have one of four possible combinations. It can be either little p, little t, or big P, big T, or little p, big T, and big P, little t. And really spend some time looking at this so you get it clear in your head how these different chromosomes randomly sort into different gametes. Independent assortment also occurs when the genes are on the same chromosome, but far enough apart. In this way, uh, crossing over occurs, and it's so frequent that basically uh, the genes far apart on the same chromosome will sort out randomly because there will be so many crossing over events that occur between them. However, genes that will have loci very close to one another on a chromosome will always tend to be inherited together because no crossing over events, no twisting around and new combinations are formed. The genes that do not assort independently into gametes um, are then said to be part of a linkage group. They're almost always inherited together. Okay, now we'll get into the concept of codominance, just to confuse you a little bit more. In the Mendelian inheritance patterns that we discussed in pea plants, we saw the effect of a dominant allele on a trait fully masking that of a recessive trait. But there's other more complex relationships between alternate forms of the same gene or alleles and the traits that are exhibited. In codominance, traits that are associated with two alleles are both fully and equally apparent in heterozygous individuals. Neither allele is dominant or recessive to the other. And the key example that we always use for this would be the ABO blood system. The alleles of the ABO gene um, encode an enzyme that modifies which carbohydrate appears on the surface of human red blood cells. And two alleles of the gene, the A and B gene, will encode slightly different versions of the enzyme. A third allele, the O, o uh, allele, has a mutation that causes a frame shift, and the protein encoded by this allele has no enzyme involved. So the carbohydrate remains unmodified. So now, instead of just talking about two possible different traits, purple versus white, we're talking about multiple alleles that can be inherited. 
This is a multiple allele system. So you could have type A, type B, or type O now. We're at three different types. And these alleles are the basis of your ABO blood type. Alleles A and B are what we call codominant when, pa when paired. So you can have inherited gene A from mom and gene B from dad, and then you have both versions and your blood type ends up being what we call type AB. The type O allele is recessive. And so when it's paired with either the A or the B allele. And so your genotype, if your blood type A can be either AA or A and O. If your genotype, or I mean, sorry, if your blood phenotype is type B, you can be a genotype that is either BB or BO. And the only way you end up with type O blood is if you've inherited both recessive forms, an O from mom and an O from dad, to end up being type O. All right, so let's look at this in a picture. That might make it more clear for you. Okay, so this is uh, the differences in the ABO blood types. And to keep this straight, um, and know that it's on the same gene, uh, typically geneticists will use uh, the I designation as the gene. And then we put a little superscript of what type of gene you carry next to it. And here you see um, going across as the, the alleles, if you inherit the allele for the A type A blood, you see I with A. And it's written as a capital letter because it is dominant. And you see also that you have capital I with B, you know, written in capital letters because B is also dominant. So they're co-dominant. And then for type O, you see a little I with none. And usually I would put the notation of an O with that just to keep tra track of which blood type. And then if we see the genotypes compared to the phenotypes in the boxes below, you see that the red blood cell appearance for an IA with the A enzyme on it is either uh, you have inherited an IAIA, okay, both type A from mom and from dad, and you end up with type A blood. Or you have IA dominant with the recessive, the little I, or an O, and you can end up being a heterozygote for type A blood. For type B blood, you can be homozygous dominant for both. IB, IB, capital I, capital I, both with a B designation. Or similarly, you can be heterozygous and end up with a phenotype for uh, blood type B. You can end up with capital IB from one parent and the little I, and I would put the O designation there, um, and end up with type B. To end up with type AB, you had to have inherited an A from mom and a B from dad or vice versa. So you have to get one gene from each parent. And that's the only way you end up with type AB blood. And to end up with type O blood, you had to inherit and be homozygous recessive, both alleles. And here's the picture from your book. And it shows... Uh, in your book, it did the inheritance patterns, patterns leaving out the I uh, designation and just went with AA or AO. But I think you get into trouble when you start doing it that way. And I know a lot of you probably learn this way in your high school classes. Um, but start using the more geneticist-derived notation. Okay, so I'll show you how I do this on the next slide. Okay, so for questions concerning blood type, like I said, do IAIA or you can be IA and IO and knowing that O is recessive. If you wanted to, you could make that a small letter I showing that it's recessive. For type B, you have to inherit a B from both parents or a B and an O from the other parent and be heterozygous. For type A, you can inherit a uh, an A gene from one parent and a B gene from the other. And for type O, you've had to have inherited 
and be homozygous recessive, inheriting the O gene from both parents. So let's figure this out. We're going to do a cross of a type AB mom with a father who's type O. So what do we know? We know that mom has to have one gene that's IA and one gene that's IB. And dad has to have both genes as a recessive O and an O. Okay, so if I were you, I would pause right here and try to see if you can set up a Punnett square for this on your own. And then we'll work it out together on the next slide. Okay, so how you should have set this up is dad is I-O, I-O, off to work he goes, right? <laughs> and mom is I-A and I-B. So let's set up our square where we're going across and in our segregation of our uh, homologous chromosomes, mom has some gametes that will get the IA gene and some that will get the IB gene. For dad, he can only produce gametes that have IO. So here is our possible combinations. Going across the row, an IO from dad can combine with an IA from my mom and we'll have a child that's born with a genotype IA IO and a phenotype will be type A blood. In the next box, we see that a child could potentially have inherited a gamete from mom that was IB and a gamete from dad that was IO, and they'll form a zygote or a child that is IB IO. So they're heterozygous and form the phenotype of type B blood with the heterozygous IB IO genotype. Similarly, on the bottom row, once again, we inherit the IA gamete from mom and the IO from dad, and the child would be type A blood and a heterozygote. Similarly, you could also get an IB from mom and another IO from dad, and the child would be type B blood with a uh, genotype IB IO. So we have two genotypes, either IA IO or IB and IO, and it's 50-50, or one half to one half, right? And the phenotypes will be either type A or type B, and they're always heterozygous. And you can see how in the old days, before we uh, did DNA analysis, how sometimes we could determine paternity cases based on blood type. So let's say RIA IB mom, our AB, mom with AB blood type, turned up having a baby that had blood type A. Would that be possible? Yes. And if the baby turned up having blood type B, would that be possible? Yes. Obviously. Now, if mom had a baby that turned up being type AB blood, would that be, would our IO, IO dad be the possible father of that baby? No. Okay. So mama was up to something no good. In cases of incomplete dominance, one allele is not fully dominant over the other. So the heterozygous phenotype is an intermediate blend of the two homozygous phenotypes. Yes, of course, we had to have another situation that renders everything a little bit more complicated. Here, alleles of a gene that affect flower color in snapdragons offers a really good example. One allele represented by capital R encodes an enzyme that makes a red pigment. Another, represented by a small r, has a mutated allele that cannot make any pigment. Plants homozygous for the R allele, or big R, big R, make a lot of red pigment, so they have brightly red flowers. Plants homozygous for the little r allele, or little r, little r, make no pigment, so their flowers are white. The heterozygous plants that are somewhere in between big R, little r, 
make only enough red pigment to tint their flowers pink. So you can see there's basically a dosage effect where the plant that is homozygous for the big R allele has an enzyme that makes lots and lots of red pigment coloring the red flower, whereas a plant that only gets one dose of that R gene and thus the enzyme made by it only gets half the amount and thus makes enough pigment to color the plant pink. Let's look at this cross on the next slide. Here is a cross of our homozygous parent that is uh, homozygous for the pigment producing gene, big R, big R, crossed with a homozygous parent that produces no enzyme for no pigment, little r, little r. And it produces offspring that are only big R, little r, so all the offspring are pink. Now, when we do our dye hybrid cross for our next generation, I'm sorry, our monohybrid cross of our next generation, we're going to cross a pink flower with a pink flower. And we will see how the cross between the two heterozygous plants for this one trait yields red, pink, and white flowered offspring in a one to two to one ratio. And you'll see the genotype pattern is just what we saw before in our uh, monohybrid cross of the, men, uh, of the pea plants, Mendel's pea plants. However, our, heterozy our heterozygotes were similar in appearance to the homozygous dominant, those three boxes, right? But now the homozygous uh, genotype is actually revealed in the phenotype. So here we have some of the progeny, the, uh, one fourth of the progeny will be big R, big R and be red. Whereas half of the progeny will be big R, little r. And only one quarter will be little r, little r. And those will be white. In a pattern that's called polygenic inheritance, alleles of two or more genes will determine the form of a single trait. So hundreds of genes might be involved, with each gene making a small contribution to the observed phenotype. Consider how fur color in dogs and other animals arises from pigments called melanins. The color of brown or black fur arises from a dark brown form of melanin. A reddish melanin colors fur yellow or tan. The products of several genes interact to make these melanins and deposit them in fur. We're going to look at uh, the fur color in Labrador retrievers on the next slide. In Labrador retriever dogs, alleles of two genes determine whether the individual has either black fur, brown fur, or yellow fur. The product of a gene known as tier P1 helps, makes, uh, helps make brown melanin. A dominant allele of this gene, represented by Big B, results in a higher production of the brown melanin than the recessive allele, little b. The product of another gene, MC1R, affects the type of melanin that's produced. A dominant allele, Big E, of this gene triggers production of the brown melanin, while its recessive partner, little e, has a mutation that, result, that will result in the production of a red form. Dogs that are homozygous for the little e allele are yellow because they can only make that reddish melanin color. This pattern of polygenic inheritance in which an allele of one gene will mask the effect of a different gene is called epistasis. So note that epistasis is not the same thing as dominance, which describes the relationship between alleles on one gene, on the same gene. This is an interaction between the products of two different genes. So let's look at that here 
with our Labrador Retrievers. Aren't they cute? All right, interactions amongst the products of the two genes will affect the fur color. Dogs with alleles that are both dominant, big E and big B, will have black fur, okay, because they're getting um, that higher production of the brown melanin and that other gene, the MC1R gene, um, affects the type of melanin that's produced and it allows that brown melanin to come through, okay? Those with a big E and two uh, recessive little b alleles will just have brown fur. And dogs that are homozygous re recessive for the little E will have yellow fur, regardless of whether they have big B or little b coloring. Okay, and this is a lot harder for most students to understand. So try to work that out and you'll, you'll get it. Okay, we can also see this in um, patterns for hair coloring. So our hair color genes are um, hypostatic to the baldness genes, okay? And so this means that the baldness phenotype is going to prevail regardless of which hair color you demonstrate in human beings. A pleiotropic gene is a gene that influences multiple traits. So mutations in its expression um, or its product will affect a bunch of different traits throughout the body. And you'll find this exists in many complex genetic disorders. And Marfan's disorder is a very good prototype of a pleiotropic gene. It results in a mutation in a gene for fibrillin, and fibrillin shows up in many, many different tissues throughout our body parts. And so when it's altered, many different body parts are affected. So this is pleiotropy. Okay, so in Marfan syndrome, a pleiotropic gene affects the gene for fibrillin. Fibrillin is a fiber kind of like collagen. It's an elastic protein and it's in many, many different structures in the body. And so when this gene is defective, many different structures in our body become defective. So think about this. Fibrillin is a glycoprotein and it's essential for the formation of elastic fibers that are found in connective tissue. You have connective tissue everywhere in your body. You have it in your eye, you have it in your heart, you have it in your skin. Since fibrillin is what's found in connective tissue, and connective tissue is found throughout the body, the disorder from this defect or Marfan syndrome, Marfan syndrome affects many different parts of the body. Features of the disorder are most often found in tissues that contain a lot of this elastic tissue, such as the heart, the blood vessels, the bones, the joints, and the eyes. And I had a former brother-in-law who had this, and it is a horrendous disease um, to uh, have inherited. And pretty frequently, they will die from uh, aortic dissection or rupture from the elastic walls and stretches in the um, aorta, the large blood vessel that leaves the heart. Very life-threatening. And here... You see a picture of a Isaiah Austin. He was a basketball player, uh, played for Baylor, obviously, you see there. And he was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome uh, just before the 2014 NBA draft. He was supposed to be a first-round uh, draft prospect, but learning that his heart could rupture um, ended his dream of becoming an NBA player. In a way, went all those NBA salary dreams. So this was uh, financially devastating for him. But of course, um, playing in the NBA would have threatened his life. And getting the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome probably saved his life. It's thought that Abraham Lincoln suffered from Marfan syndrome. So let's go through some of the phenotypes and why people think this about Abraham Lincoln.
So Marfan syndrome, this defect is estimated to be about two to three per 10,000 people. And it's inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion in families. Or as in the case of my brother-in-law, it was inherited as a new mutation, a de novo or new fresh mutation that just happened in him. So these mutations occur in, the extra, in this extracellular matrix protein called fibrillin, which is a main player in the forming of connective tissue and confers the elasticity in that tissue. And as I said, this tissue affects many of the body systems, particularly the skeletal system and the cardiovascular system, as well as in the eye. And what you end up with is you get overgrowth of the long bones. So you'll find the Marfan's body type results in people having long uh, spider-like fingers, they call it arachnodactyly, and long, uh, long bones, and they're very tall. And you could see in my former brother-in-law, um, former because of my divorce, not that he's died, thank goodness, he's a very nice, wonderful person. Um, he was born in a family of a bunch of uh, little petite Italians, and then suddenly there he is, towering over everybody at about six foot four. Uh, one of the problems that happens in Marfan syndrome is they get what's called lens octopia, or they get a dislocation of their ocular lens, and so they have early diagnosis of um, eye problems. They also get a thickening of their heart valves, and this can lead to mitral valve prolapse. And of course, the big devastating thing is, is they frequently die from an aortic aneurysm and dissection. And my brother-in-law actually had this and he was rushed to U of M hospital and uh, they were able to uh, put in an artificial aortic valve and initial segment of his aorta and saved his life. And since this is an autosomal dominant uh, gene, 50% of any of his children are likely to have inherited that gene. So it's very scary and it uh, has huge consequences for family planning. So not everything and not all traits are um, uh, completely inherited. There's the old phrase, nature versus nurture, that refers to the debate about whether human behavioral traits arise from genetics or from environmental factors. Are you smart because you were born with high IQ genes or are you smart because your parents surrounded you with books rather than plopping you in front of a television set? So um, there's always a debate about what co contribution and it's usually surrounding things like intelligence or behavioral ph phenomenon. Um, is there a criminal gene or are you criminal because you were surrounded with criminals? You know, things like that. Um, and we summarize this thinking with the equation that your genotype plus your environment is what creates your ultimate phenotype. So epigenetics is an area of research that's revealing how the environment makes a big contribution in this equation bigger than what biologists initially thought. So environment environmental cues will initiate cell signaling pathways that can in turn trigger changes in the way genes are expressed. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in later chapters. Um, some of the cell signaling pathways uh, result in methylation of particular regions of DNA. And this will either uh, suppress or in the case of maybe non-methylation, non allow expression of different genes. So in humans and other animals, DNA methylation patterns can permanently and heritably be affected by our diet, by stress, by exercise, and also by exposure to drugs and toxins like tobacco and alcohol. Epigenetics is a very hot area of research right now. So environmentally driven changes in gene expression patterns can be permanent and they can be inherited. These changes are implemented by gene controls um, such as chromatin modifications or 
RNA interference that will act on the DNA itself. And as I said, the big example that we have of these is DNA methylation. If you add a methyl group capping off part of a DNA molecule, it can prevent certain genes from being expressed. So here's an example of this. We can have two mice that are twins, identical twins. They're born with the exact DNA sequence, but they ended up having different coat colors. And how did that happen? And this is through epigenetics. In this particular example, a yellow mouse strain uh, is born. But when a mother is given a diet that was enriched in folic acid, which is a good source for epigenetic methylation of DNA, the resulting coat color is more brown pups being born, born than yellow pups. This is an example of how your diet can cause epigenetic changes to affect an individual without physically altering the DNA sequence. Another example of this is the effect of altitude on the growth of yarrow plants. Genetically identical yarrow plants will grow at different heights depending on the altitude at which they are grown at. In humans, we talk about psych psychiatric disorders having uh, a lot of epigenetic uh, effect. So among psychiatric disorders like autism, depression, schizophrenia, schizophrenia bipolar disorder, or ADHD, attention deficit disorder, um, there are mutations uh, that have an epigenetic component. So there must be environmental components that will affect these disorders as well, because the majority of people who have the mutations never end up with these psychiatric disorders. Moreover, one person with the mutations might get one type of disorder, while a relative with the same mutation might get another disorder. So two different phenotypes can result from the same genetic underpinning. And as I said, this is a really active area of research. And this slide shows you some of the uh, epigenetic phenomenon. Under low oxygen conditions, a water flea will switch on genes involved in producing hemoglobin. This makes um, a red protein that will enhance the abilities to take up ox oxygen in the water. So the water flea on the left has been living in water that has normal oxygen content, whereas the one on the right is in water with a low oxygen content. In B, you see these uh, snowshoe hares that have fur color that varies by season. A hare's summer fur is brown and in winter it's white, and both color forms offer seasonally appropriate camouflage from their predators. And at the bottom, you see the difference in the yarrow plant that depends on the elevation at which it grows. Now, most of what we uh, have talked about would uh, be inherited patterns where we saw one trait having one form versus another, very, very distinct forms. But often our traits are the results of complex genetic interactions, and they aren't really either or. Some traits occur in a range of small differences that's called continuous variation. And continuous variation can be an outcome of epistasis, in which multiple genes will affect a single trait. The more genes and environmental factors that influence a trait, the more there's continuous variation. For example, in human height. Human height can, varies continuously, as does eye color. The colored part of the eye, or the iris, um, like skin color, is the result of interactions among gene products that make and distribute melanins. The more melanin deposited in the iris, the less light is reflected and the darker your eye will appear. And we see this on the next slide. Here you see the complex variation in traits of height and eye color. As well here, you see the complex variation in the trait of height that is distributed 
in a bell curve. Here we divided the total range of phenotypes into measurable categories, and the number of individuals in each category reveals the frequencies of phenotypes across the range of values. And when the data was plotted as a bar chart or a graph line around the top of the bars, which shows that the distribution values for the trait um, form a continuous bell-shaped curve. Traits that arise from genes with a lot of alleles may vary continuously. Consider that some genes have regions in which a series of two to six nucleotides can get repeated many times over and over again in a row. The number of these short tandem repeats can spontaneously increase or decrease during DNA replication and repair at a rate that's much faster than other mutations. And the resulting expansion and contraction of these tandem repeat regions may be preserved as an allele. For example, changes in the number of short tandem repeats have given rise to 12 alleles of a gene that influence face length in dogs. Alleles with more repeats are associated with longer faces. We also have this in humans and a syndrome that's identifiable with um, nucleotide repeats is the fragile X syndrome. Fragile X is mapped to the long, chromosome, uh, long arm of chromosome uh, X, the X chromosome, one of the sex uh, determining chromosomes. Patients can carry from 230 to over 4,000 repeats of a CGGG sequence. CGG, 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 repeated over and over again in that X chromosome. Individuals that don't have fragile X only have up to about 50 repeats of this sequence, but carriers of the disease will have probably hundreds of repeats. This confers a sort of chromosomal instability, and uh, this will present as a phenotype uh, with an intellectual disability and a particular distinctive facies or a look of particular feature about the face. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. So you see these large ears and the broad forehead in a fragile X individual. And obviously you don't see the intellectual disability, but you see the site that the arrow's pointing to called the fragile uh, site is an area where you have these multiple repeated uh, tandem uh, CGG repeats, and that gives an instability to the X chromosome. Here, you see the difference in the 12 alleles that we talked about earlier um, that results in that homeotic gene that influences the face length in dogs. So the alleles with more repeats are associated with the longer face and then you see versus the short face in a dog. All right, so let's just end this now and go to a couple of questions, uh, practice questions to see what we've learned. This has been a long and rich uh, chapter of information. Okay, so according to Mendel, if a male that is homozygous for the dominant form, PP, large P, large P of a trait, is crossed with a female that's homozygous for a recessive form of the trait. All the offspring will show which form? And the answer is the dominant form because every child will, will inherit the large P from dad and the small P from mom, and so they will be home, uh, heterozygotes, big P, little P. And if they show the form of the trait, it will be dominant. In humans, environmental factors causing stress can impact which of the following? The, de the development of all autosomal disorders, the development of autosomal recessive disorders, the development of autosomal dominant disorders, multiple allele systems, or epigenetic DNA modifications. And the obvious answer would be the epigenetic DNA modifications because that's that environmental influence on the genes. Which of the following describes changes to the genetic material but not to the genetic sequence 
that can be passed on to the next generation. And that again, we just discussed, is epigenetic phenomenon. Mendel's law of segregation requires which of the following? That the genes for the traits he studied must be located on the same chromosome, that the chromosomes be duplicated by mitosis, that only triplet organisms demonstrate inheritance patterns, that two alleles at any locus are distributed into separate gametes during meiosis, and that genes are not transmitted independently of each other. And of course, this is that two alleles at any locus are distributed into separate gametes during meiosis, okay? The gene for the human ABO blood type for which three or more alleles persist in a population at relatively high frequency is an example of which phenomenon? And this would be the multiple allele system, okay? And that's also an example of codominance. Co a and B are codominant and O is recessive. But that's not an option here, right? Okay, a cross between two individuals who are identically heterozygous for one gene is called which of the following? Dihybrid cross, monohybrid cross, test cross, or Punnett square? And this would be a monohybrid cross, okay? They're hybrid for one trait, so mono and hybrid. A hybrid with two non-identical alleles big A, little a, expresses a phenotype that is between the dominant, big A form, and the recessive form, little a form. This type of inheritance pattern is called what? And this would be incomplete dominance, such as what we uh, examined in the example of the snapdragons uh, between red and white, we had the pink phenotype. An individual that has two dominant alleles for a trait, big A, big A, is called, and this would be a homozy homozygous dominant. Now here comes our hard and challenging question. Thought I'd give you a brain break before this. So we're going to have garden peas, and one pair of alleles controls the height of the plant, and a second pair of alleles controls the flower color. We're going to cross... Um, Oh, first we need to know that the allele for tall, D, big D, is dominant to the allele for dwarf, little d, and the allele for the purple flower, big P, is dominant to the allele for a white flower, little p. So we cross a tall plant with white flowers with a dwarf plant with purple flowers, and we find that in the resulting generation, one quarter of our plants are tall and purple, one quarter are tall and white, one quarter are dwarf and purple, and one quarter are dwarf and white. What is the genotype of the parents? And you're going to have lots of problems where you need to figure this out. So we look at all the options that we have here. But first, let's write down and think about what we know, okay? So let's look at what we know first. We know that we have a plant that we're crossing that is tall and white. If it is tall, it has to have one of the dominant genes for being tall, so a big D. The second gene, we don't know. It could be either the dominant gene or a recessive gene, right? We also know that its flowers are white, so it has to carry two of the recessive genes. So D, big D, with an unknown other gene allele, and little p, little p must be the basis of the phenotype in that plant. Now, when we look at the progeny, we know that we have both re recessive traits appearing in the progeny, right? So therefore, both parents must have at least one recessive gene. So our parental parent must be big D, little d, right? Because there's no way you're going to get dwarf plants if he had if the uh, parental plant had only big D genes or big D alleles. 
So then we can go back and start crossing out things, okay? A, we know that our first plant uh, had to be little p, little p, so we can cross that out, okay? Same thing for B. Now when we get to option C, we know that we have to have our plant being big D, little d, right? Um, and it could not possibly be big D, big D. So we get to cross out options C and options E, and we're left with our answer being option D. So since you had options available, this was a little bit easier to figure out than going through and making big Punnett squares and getting all worked up that you could not figure this out. It was actually relatively easy to figure out, okay? So when you see lots of words up there and it's talking about lots of traits, take a deep breath and then think it through. It's a lot easier than you uh, think it's going to be. Okay, so now assume that we have plants with red flowers crossed with plants with white flowers to give rise to plants with pink flowers. That should ring a bell. You can eliminate the plants with red flowers by crossing what colored flower plants for the first generation and what other colored plants for the second generation. So assume that the plants with red flowers are crossed with plants with white flowers and they will give rise to plants with pink flowers. You can eliminate the plants with red flowers by crossing pink flowered plants for the first generation and white flowered plants for the second. That should make sense to you. Okay, if tall is dominant to dwarf, if the true breeding tall plant is crossed with the true breeding dwarf plant, the F2 generation will have a ratio tall, tall to dwarf in what uh, particular ratio? And this is that monohybrid cross that you should be familiar with. And you know that the tall and dominant dwarf F2 generation will have the phenotypic ratio of three to one because their F1 will all be big D, little d. And when we cross big D, little d with big D, little d, you're gonna get a ratio of three to one of the phenotypes in the next generation. Okay, that was a long chapter and we'll see you next time for chapter 14.